the ballet studio was a place I was like looking forward to leaving at the end of my career. It's become like a comforting place. If you've gone through the process of learning choreography and performing a show, you've done so many valuable things that we just take for granted out in the world. Let ballet be a positive part of your life. Multiple times, people will be like, who inspired you to dance? Who, who's like your favorite male dancer? Because I'd usually be the only guy being interviewed, and I would always be like Michael Jackson. It was always like people laughed after. Fade to Black directed and choreographed by Adam Bloodgood. That's my dream. Beyond the Mirror, Reflections of Lives Beyond the Glass. How did you take the decision to stop being a dancer and what was your first thought? My first thought? Mm -hmm. Well, I think everyone in ballet going into it, if you make it as a professional, you're already thinking about the end. And I don't mean that in a yes. negative way, but you know that your time is limited even more so than any other job. Like even a job that's great, like a lawyer or a doctor, if you get that, say, by your early 30s, you know that if you can stay healthy, you've got three decades that's at true. least. Where ballet, it's like the moment you turn 16, it's like, okay, well, you're old now. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of true. And more when you see like a 14-year-old doing more than you. Yeah, of course. Um But it was actually a positive okay. transition for me overall because I left ballet because I had another dream mm -hmm. that had to be put on the back burner because there's such a time limit for ballet. I had always grown up around a lot of movies growing up. My parents grew up in the L.A. area, so my dad was a big nerd, even though he's a musician. He mm -hmm. loved Hollywood. We would watch things like Star Wars and Alien and even some more like war films like um, Saving Private Ryan. And I don't know if you ever heard of Tora, Tora, Tora. It's like a 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. And the Dirty Dozen. And it was always like Hollywood was always cool. Not like these, not in the way that people now are like, look at how intellectual they are. He's like, isn't this like the most fun you could ever have? And yeah. so that kind of like rubbed off onto me. And um, now I'm at USC, University of Southern California and, my dad always kind of wanted one of us to go there because oh, really? my, yeah, I, I, my family goes back at that university, but doesn't for four generations, oh. meaning so my family on the blood good side are all huge Trojan fans, like of the football team. And the story goes, my uncle just told me, actually, my great grandfather moved over to the States from England okay. and he came to LA and he wanted to like get into American football. And hmm. they were the only team in town. So a lot of people, every team, you know, has its stereotypes. People are like, you, why do you like USC? It's like, well, my great grandfather didn't have anyone to root for. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and then anyway, my, that continued with my grandfather and with my uncle and my dad. Okay. But no one's actually gone to the school. So I had that side going. And then on the other side, um, I don't know what it was, but I went to Universal Studios with my aunt when I was like 11 years old. Okay. And they have, you know, the famous like backstage tram tour on backstage ballet lingo <laughs> thrown in there. I've noticed myself doing that all the, all time. the time. Yeah. And I saw sets from Back to the Future and I was like, that movie, I've always heard it's cool. And I went home to Seattle and I found like this crappy VHS tape of Back to the Future and I watched it. And I don't know why, but it finally clicked that like, wow, like people make movies. And it was very unglamorous. It was more... Like, how cool would that be to have that be your job? Yes. And fast forward, like, 10 years later, I've been, I had that thought in the back of my mind of like, wouldn't it be cool if I made movies one day? And when I was working at Dayton Ballet, I had a lot of spare time. My apartment was really cheap, so I wasn't having to work a ton <laughs> on the side. This is in Ohio. This is in Ohio, yeah. And remember Netflix DVDs? Like, mm -hmm. there was a phase back then. One, keep in mind, like film school is completely out of reach. No, not, not yeah. even out of reach, like not even a thought. I was 22 years old, maybe. I was in the throat, the throes of my ballet career. Like, yes. this is my life, my this identity. This is what you're do forever. Exactly. Like the, the thought of being done. I was too, I was too new to be thinking about mm -hmm. that. But I always, and this is a feeling that I think everyone always has. I had this feeling of like, I've never seen any of like the movies you're supposed to have seen. Like, I hadn't seen anything, and I, I still feel that way. I feel like that all the time, because sometimes you ask me, like, have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? And I'm like, 
I thought I have seen a lot of movies, but clearly I don't. Well, just know that I'm like 15 years behind the times, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I had someone tell me once, like, you have a lot of, you put a lot of pressure on your friends to know culture from like 1995. And I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, some of those movies are very good. Yeah. I was watching, yesterday I was getting a haircut. And the guy was having a movie from 1984, something like that, 1982. I don't remember the name, but it's this fighting movie. The quality of it and everything, it was spotless. I was like, I don't think people know how to make those movies anymore. Like, yeah. It was so well done, like so good. I was like, wow. I was, I literally didn't even know that he finished because I was watching the movie. It was crazy. Oh, isn't that yeah. awesome? And I feel like, the democratization of the film world has been so cool because mm -hmm. anyone can pick up a phone and make something. make something. And I don't want that to go away. So no. I don't want this to come across the wrong way. However, I was talking to somebody recently who shot their first movie on film. Okay. And they were saying how everything is so much more thought out because it's so expensive. You have to. Yeah, every single shot is planned and they would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and then finally be like, okay, let's roll. And everyone, you know, tensed up and it was like a performance where, I don't know, like I haven't been on a ton of film sets to know this, but the ones I have been on, there is this sense that it's digital of like, let's try one. Let's let's we shoot the it. rehearsal. Like, and, and I'm sure that was the case maybe for... Big, big budget movies. Ma mega budget. Uh -huh. People love to just imagine that everything's Steven Spielberg, but that's like such a privileged, tiny place that mm -hmm. only he owns. You know, no one else has that yep. luxury. And I love the guy, but the, sometimes people don't realize that there's a big gap between like the legends and then even people who they think have made it still have to work within certain constraints. Yep. No, totally. Now that we are going kind of like more in your future, how did you find yourself thinking as a dancer in this new age of Adam, you know, like, how do you, how are you implementing what you learn as a dancer in this new war? Like, are you, are you not, or? I think that ballet is so much more than being on stage or the technique. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes as dancers, we think that our skills don't transfer over, but there's a lot about being a ballet dancer that we don't really talk about publicly that comes to play in the real world. Like mm. knowing how to talk to people that you don't know, just coming from almost being forced to mingle with donors and stuff as a, as a kid ended up being a majorly beneficial skill to have where yeah. constantly I'm put in front of people I've never talked to before. And I'm just go up and be like, Hey, where are you from? Like another hot day we're having. And I can find little cues of what interests them and connect with people. And that, that, so I would say that that part of dancing has been an interesting lead into, into the, into the normal world. And I also think that we develop a way of seeing that mm -hmm. is more kinetic. And I know that sounds really pretentious, but I just think that we have such a connection with the world and how things move physically. Cause we've been yes. forced to think that way mm -hmm. for so long that, it comes as it comes as a benefit when it just when you're thinking about things like aesthetic and camera movement how somebody walks exactly and even into something i would have never thought about is we have this innate sense of like production design mm -hmm. that i think people who haven't been in the theater don't understand where it's like i think back of we've experienced this at like every company where mm -hmm. there's like so many discussions about like colors of the lights and the costumes and the overall feel of the production the scene or whatever yeah yeah and, and most people if they haven't grown up in that environment that's the first time they're thinking that mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they're not skilled they just yeah they're not steeped in it mm -hmm. it's not in their brain already yeah it's like yeah they're, they're not thinking like, oh that red color of it, there is matching a little bit with the shirt or something, and that is giving it the scene a little bit more, I don't know, yeah, compact. I don't know how to say it, but that's pretty cool. Um, and you were saying something about the, the, way, the, the way people move. Yeah. I feel like sometimes I could be watching a movie and, like, it's so good, like, the scene, everything, but then I see, like, they have their physical or something, or, like, the hand goes wrong, and I'm like... It will have been perfect if somebody will have just telling them how to like grab this, you know, I don't know. 
did you find yourself like thinking that when you're watching something or like maybe when you guys are doing yes and i find that that's highly valued not to go back to steven spielberg but people always talk about how he's such a master of blocking which mm -hmm. is a fancy way of saying he understands choreography on like a non-ballet level yes and i think that camera movement is also a choreography but to get yes. to get back to what you're saying though i think that ballet has always been the key to making Hollywood look aesthetically pleasing. Because if you think about a lot of, a lot of especially like female characters that like are perfect, usually mm -hmm. have a ballet background. Like, yes. um, I can't remember her name, but from Alias, Jennifer or something or other, I, it will come to me. But um, you know Charlize Theron, like mm -hmm. she's a great example. She's a former ballerina. And mm. I don't know if you ever seen Aeon Flux, but that movie is no. absolutely incredible. She's like, it's early 2000s. She's like doing cartwheels and stuff and, huh. Everything is is very balletic because it's aesthetically, it's aesthetically pleasing. pleasing. Like the feet point the mm -hmm. right way, and like the shoulder positioning is just right. And while other people might take credit, like the fight coordinators or whatever, like it's definitely she had in that, that. background that helps her move. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we were talking a little bit about like, do you feel like like a nostalgia or like something? about the ballet war or are you combining them like now or do you see yourself for example like in the future making a movie related to dance or not at all yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i no, mean course, i was hoping to yeah yeah um i will always be nostalgic for my time as a dancer and mm -hmm. i think that anyone who's honest with themselves will feel similarly because you know being a ballet dancer has its ups and downs as we know but I really ultimately we're so fortunate to have something that we love so much. There's nothing more that I, I don't know. I always feel sorry when I meet someone who truly has like no interest, mm -hmm. but you can tell that they like want to find that thing. Yes. And for me, that thing was ballet. So it will always be my first love. It will, no matter how I think about it, it'll always be like this romantic memory. You know, when I, when I was thinking about retiring, this is a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was before we came to Eugene, I met with a mentor of mine in Seattle and I was like, I don't, I kind of want to be done in the next few years, but I don't know what to do. And he was very unhelpfully like, well, ballet is a tough act to follow. And I was like, gee, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, to, to answer the second it half. It is true. Yeah. To answer the second half of your question though, I would like to go into ballet in the film world to some mm -hmm. degree, but Right now, I'm really interested in the stories of the performers in like the golden age of Hollywood, okay. like the dancers and like Singing in the Rain was nostalgic film itself came out in the 50s. But like you watch those old like Fred Astaire movies from the 1930s, there's all these incredible dancers that are kind of on the sidelines. It's like, what is their story? Mm -hmm. So that to me is where my head is at right now. Okay. I'd love to explore that a little more. It's pretty interesting. I never, I never thought of it. But also you get you are now in film school, so you're probably finding all these little places that a lot of people haven't touched or something. Or maybe they have, but they are not really like yeah. mass well, media or something. Well, that's where the ballet dancer in me is coming out because I'm only seeing that because I'm coming into Hollywood as a dancer. Mm -hmm. And then I see... So I'm coming into Hollywood as a dancer, and so I'm starting to watch more films, and that's where I'm finding these things. It's not like I'm out searching for something that has not been done. It's more done. of like, I see them, I relate to them because I am a dancer. And now I'm, <laughs> now I'm awkwardly on a film set too. <laughs> uh, being, being on the school right now, like how, how has it changed for you? Like from going to a place where you were moving every single day to now, like probably not moving as much compared Because at least probably like filming and do, being on a crew, you still have to move. Like it's kind of like a physical job still. But it's in a different way. Like, how did you find yourself in that area? It was a tough adjustment, especially at first, because it's quite ironic. Because I was, the last few years of my career, I was in a lot of pain, as we all are. And I was like, oh, I wish I didn't have to spend so much time, like, getting myself warm and all doing those PT. things. But then when I wasn't doing it, it, like, really messed with my head, where <laughs> I was like, something's wrong. I'm going to hurt myself. And I was like, no, all you have to do is walk to class for the next month. You don't have to like go do a double tour or something yeah. like that. So <laughs> um, that transition has gotten better, but I honestly have just 
I think I'll always be physical to some degree. Mm-hmm. It's been nice to have a little more opportunity to try new things. Like I've been playing racquetball with a friend of oh, mine really? who's from the East Coast. Yeah, he's huh. always like, no one plays racquetball here. And I was like, because we're west of the Mississippi, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have never seen anybody playing racquetball. I also skateboard now. Did you oh, know that? The skateboard. Yeah. It's so pretty, pretty filmmaker. I I know, know? I know. I feel like such a I feel like such a cliche. But the reason why is um, the campus is flat. Okay, so it's perfect for you to like go around. Exactly, and you know I'm not trying to put down the school, but the parking lots are like extremely far away from oh, the campus. Okay. It's like oh, three quarters of a mile, oh, and yeah. so it's cut my time down like <laughs> like crazy. And I started asking my friends who are you know a lot younger. I'd be like, so. uh I'm thinking about getting a skateboard and most of their answers were like, oh, I didn't try it until I knew I was coming here and I heard that it was great. So there's a lot of people who skateboard literally for transportation. Just for transportation. Yeah. That makes total sense. I mean, I will do it too. When you were thinking of like choices to do next, did you ever fell back in like, if this doesn't work out, maybe I'll be like a ballet teacher or like something else. Like, have you ever had that thought? You know what I mean? I don't know. Yes, but honestly, it went from being a scary thought to a comforting thought. Because this fall, I choreographed a Nutcracker on a school that's like a little bit north of L.A. And at first I was like, oh, man, I wanted to get away from teaching and all that sort of thing. But mm-hmm. in a way, it sounds a little bit like Stockholm Syndrome. But as much as the ballet studio was a place I was like looking forward to leaving at the end of my career, it's mm-hmm. become like a comforting place. I think you've seen that a little bit. You know, I come home to Eugene yeah, and, you, and I yeah. teach company class and it's like the happiest I am all month It's because it is home. It's like even though it used to feel like my abuser, I've learned that that was just me complaining yeah. first world problems. So knowing that I have that set of skills and then I could fall back on that if nothing works out is actually, it's positive. It's not okay. my dream. It's not your back. But That's yeah. good. And that was my question. Like, did you find yourself like searching for a little bit of dance now in your career? Like going to a different place and choreographing all these things in your spare time and all of that. So are you enjoying that now? No, I am enjoying that. And I think that right now I'm in a place because, you know, Izzy dances here at Ballet Fantastique where I really get the best of both worlds because my body was ready for retirement. Mm-hmm. But I will always love dance. And so I love when I get to come back and I get to teach company class. I get to go to the shows. The fact that I've even gotten to do some like nominal stage crew stuff has mm-hmm. been a blast. But yeah. if, if I didn't have all that, I think it would have felt a lot more like quitting cold turkey. I think I'd be having a harder time. Well, right thing. now I get to kind of live vicariously through Ballet Fantastic. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, probably that's also like an easier transition. Yeah. Because it's not like, okay, now I am a filmmaker. I'm not a dancer anymore. Even though you're going to steal a dancer your whole life, you know? Yeah. But that's pretty interesting. I really like that. Now, what's been interesting about the film world specifically is that when you're compared to ballet where you're auditioning for a job, you know, it's hard to get a job, but you know that your goal is to become a dancer who learns choreography, either mm-hmm. new or old, and performs it. Rinse and repeat. And yeah. that's your dream. And there's nothing wrong with that because Mm -hmm. that's an oversimplified version. It also comes with getting to be on stage and getting to go and experience. Honestly, the life of a ballet dancer is really great, even with all of its drawbacks. Yeah. And But then the film world, you come in there and and you think that there's only so many jobs. You think there's, oh, there's like director, producer, editor, and then there's the guy who holds the sound uh pole. I don't know why. I I come from a musician background, so making fun of the sound (laughs) people, it's like a a must for me. (laughs) But yeah, and then you go, but then you get into the film world and it's like you might want one of those jobs, but then there's like all kinds of different jobs. There's like a special effects sound editor. There's like a previs um, computer graphics person, mm-hmm. which, you know, I know that you know this, but I'll just explain it like previsual is what that stands for. It's like when they make a really low resolution rendering of like an action sequence sometimes using just like blocks and shapes so they can plan like a big action scene Mm -hmm. in avengers for an example yeah that's pretty interesting did you find yourself like thinking uh, for example like do you want to be a fire choreographer or something like that like choreographing a little piece for the dance like having the camera already in mind like 
that has been like one of your thoughts or something like that? Yes. Um, my professor recently asked me, he's like, what is your dream? And my mm -hmm. dream is to have a r real movie. And what I mean by that is like a movie with a budget, uh -huh. like a real budget, fade to black, directed and choreographed by Adam Bloodgood. That's my dream. Okay. So I, I do, I haven't thought about it for fight and all of that sort of thing other than, you know, I made a really fun movie with with Derek. I don't think I've uh -huh. ever showed you that movie, but yeah. it had like a like a tiny bit of that sort of thing. But that is interesting because my older brother is a, is a stuntman. I don't know if you okay. knew that. No, you didn't know so, that. So yeah, he deals with, with a lot of those choreographers and things like that. Whoa. But it's one of those things where it almost feels unobtainable. It's like, how do you become a fight? Like I, a fight choreographer. Yeah, like, where do you learn those skills? Like, how do you prove that? To I, them? Be, I feel like you already kind of can prove that because you are a dancer. You already kind of know how the body works. Yeah. And I feel like you could figure out how the punches and the movement goes. And more if you already kind of give them an idea of how the camera will visualize that better. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I feel like no. you're cool. That no, that would be really cool. And I what's what I think is funny is I have a friend who is a professional martial artist and he okay. always complains to me about how unrealistic movies the are, are and how bad the choreography is. And I'm like, well that means to prove your points, like that means that you could just kind of like wing it and if it looks cool, mm -hmm. it might work to a it certain might, extent. Totally. Yeah. I mean that is I feel like that's kind of interesting because I feel like you need an expert on every area to make a good movie. Yeah. But at the same time you cannot find that expert on every I mean, that would be like a huge budget. I mean, yeah. some movies have those budgets, but it would be so hard to find everything. I don't know. But also that would make it a very great and very unique movie because yeah. it's having like every single skill perfect. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like, you know, once again, there's like a few people who can make that happen. But yes. most of the time we're kind of we're kind of just making it work. That That's the other thing where being a ballet dancer has been really beneficial because people that have not come from our world don't understand what it's like to have like zero budget mm -hmm. and have to, and what it, what being creative actually means. Cause I think a lot of people think of being creative as being like really wealthy and doing whatever you want. For, being creative is usually like, here's $1, make it look like 50 and you're yeah. like, okay. <laughs> Find the resources to make this thing look amazing. That's totally true. Have you made any movies or anything lately? Lately, so the last movie I made was over the summer. Okay. I've been been very busy, but we've been starting to do small projects, and I've been working in Unreal Engine a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so right now for one of my assignments, I'm working on recreating a scene from Westworld. Have you ever seen that show on HBO? Westworld? I don't know. Oh, you would definitely like love it. it. Yeah. Huh. Um, with one of with one of my fellow students who is an actress and so i'm gonna film her against a crappy green screen okay. just probably like in a common area at the cafe or the yeah. dorms or something and then take that and put it inside of this like western 3d world that i have okay. huh. pretty interesting i feel like green screens are so hard to work on oh and they're such a pain but they if you do it right it's such a magical thing i mean the other day we were watching Wakanda Forever. Yeah. Right? And then we watched the how they make it or whatever, the little documentary that they give you after. I was shocked that half of the half of the movie is fake. Yeah. Like everything is fake. They were never there. I was like, that looks so real. Like how they make this so I was is that movie, away. is it mostly green screen or do they do it's stuff on the... Screen. Okay. It's the blue screen. But they're not doing it with like the LED wall. It's like, it's no, like old school still. Yes. Wow. The LED wall is also amazing. I think it was Batman, the one that I saw that it was with the LED wall. Yeah. Oh, it's insane. Because that's an Unreal Engine too, as well. Because I don't know if you've seen like how they do that, but essentially they have a virtual camera that is usually hooked up to the, the physical the, camera. And so wherever you move that in space, moves, the background yeah. moves in real time. So it's cra it's amazing. That's insane technology. I mean, it probably solves any problem a filmmaker could have. It's like, okay, let's go to Mars. Think. Yeah. That's it. It's, it's, uh, it's an incredible time to be a filmmaker mm -hmm. because it's so overwhelming, all the AI stuff. But what's great about it is it's overwhelming for everyone. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like the great reset of the film world where I feel like things were getting very comfortable and very mm -hmm. established. And now things are just being flipped on its head all the time. And 
my teacher in my class that I have right now, is, we've been talking about AI this whole semester. And every other week he comes in and he's like, hey, so this new thing came out. Now you can input two videos and tell it to combine and then change the location of both of them and it will like do and it. It will do it for you. Yeah, over the cloud in like a minute. Yeah. It's amazing. In like a second. Yeah, it's insane. Sometimes it's scary to think about it, but it's also like wonderful to have it. But at the same time, it's like, are people going to get more lazy or more creative with it? And I think that defines how to use the AI like, yeah. correctly. Because, you know, like you can find somebody to give you a paper, you know, like probably you have homework. It's like, okay, just write me this. Yeah. It's going to give it to you in half a second. It but, is crazy. But, you know, like, I don't know. Did you guys, is, is it banned in the schools? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting topic right now. So I have this teacher that I had for my intro to cinema class. Okay. And now I have him for a sci-fi class, but he's very opinionated about technology. So it's really <laughs> fun to have him in this Serves, yeah, where he's like, I don't have anything in my house that like records my voice. And I hate the fact that my cell phone even like listens to what I'm saying. He's very like anti-tech and he has this whole thing about how they will know if we're using chat GPT, to do. which is which is not true. But they will you, never know. You can kind of tell, though, because it's very it's very bland. Like there's like zero personality in it. If you use it right, <laughs> use it right. <laughs> you will never know. It's, it's insane, like, what you can do with it. Like, ugh. Sometimes I find the titles for the videos of things out of ChatGPT. Yeah. Do you know what's really fun is if you just tell it to have you, if you tell it to make a story outline. One time I was on there and, and you know, you don't have to keep all this in there, but no, I was like, fine. I was like, write me a story where like hippies on pogo sticks beat the Nazis. And and it was like, it came up with this whole story about how like, because they they like the velocity of the pogo sticks helped them crack this code, like take down the Nazis and all this stuff. And it was just absolutely hilarious. And I was like, wow, a computer came up with this from these like four words they gave it. It's insane. I think, I mean, it's going to revolutionize everything. Oh, we'll yeah. see what happens in like 10 years. It's going to be a little bit scary at the same time. Yeah. Because I feel like I don't, this is kind of like interesting. I feel like I don't feel threatened by it as a dancer because I don't think it's good. Like, kind of like what you say, it's kind of bland. I don't think it's going to have like an emotion to portray. And like the beauty of a dance of to see in a real life performance is that you're going to see also mistakes. Yeah. That you're also going to see somebody having a moment differently, you know, like a machine will only will replicate it. Yeah. And replicate it. So it will become just like a simple line. But when you see a human, it will have all these peaks and emotions. Is that what makes it interesting? Yeah. Right? So I don't feel like as a dancer, I'm trying to, like, can you say the word threatened? Yeah. By it. But eventually, I think it's going to be so good that it might even can replicate how I do it. Yeah. And it will replicate also my mistakes. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because there's been a lot of talk about, have you heard Bruce Willis sold the rights to his, like, image? Image? No. So... People can are allowed to if obtain rights to use basically a deep fake of him now that he's mm -hmm. retired from acting, which is crazy. But I've seen so many deep fakes of like, you know, Harrison Ford DH mm -hmm. to like 30 some years old or the, you know, the famous like I love the Tom Cruise deep fakes where it's like him like being excited about like the dumbest things. I saw something on Instagram where he was just like, Ugh. he's like, I met the queen and it was awesome. You know, like <laughs> yeah. this like him going crazy. But there's still something unconvincing about all of those things mm -hmm. to me. It's like I, if someone was like, oh, you got to see this movie. It's Tom Hanks, but he's like Tom Hanks from 1990. I'd be like, I'd still rather see aging Tom Hanks now. Like, mm -hmm. But then again, sometimes I wonder how many opinions we have are going to be generational things. Like, w will, will that opinion be the same as like my grandma being like, I refuse to get a DVD player because I like VHS. Will I, will, will. Will that opinion seem just as like dusty? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, actually, I never thought about it that way, but yeah, probably. I mean, yeah, it's kind of like what you say with the DVD. I don't think people thought that they were going to have their movies on their cell phones. Yeah. And now they do. And nobody's asking for a DVD. And if you are, it's because you are from that generation. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, I know. It's like, it's too bad because Blu-rays ultimately still have the higher bit rate and quality. Oh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't even notice. I forgot too. 
But yeah, it is it is insane how that wasn't that long ago. So we we're talking about Roku's before we started recording. Mm-hmm. When the first Roku came out, do you remember when everyone was talking about like the internet of things? Basically, it was when smart devices were first catching on, like smart lights you could mm-hmm. control with your phone, coffee makers, whatever. And Roku and the Chromecast came out around the same time and mm-hmm. they were competing with each other. And I remember getting a Roku. And my older brother was like, are you sure? Like you could buy like five or six DVDs with that and the streaming quality isn't quite there. And that was only 10 years ago. And now it knows. it's like, I don't know. It's like the reason I don't buy Blu-rays is because I don't have a Blu-ray, Blu-ray player anymore. Yeah. 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 I don't, I mean, I kind of do with the PlayStation, <laughs> but yeah. the rest, I don't think I ever bought a Blu-ray DVD. I was about to say, have you ever even done like Redbox or anything like that? Yes, yes. We did, we before we had Netflix like five or six years ago. Yeah, because we that's kind of when we got Netflix. We used to like that was our dating. Like we will go to the Safeway, go to the Redbox, rent the movie that we wanted to see, you know, and return it the next day. Oh, like, good. <laughs> see, this is where I am an old person. I'm like I'm like good times. Like why does that make me feel good? Because it was like that much more work. You had to go to the store and yep. spend the time and the gas and all that. Where now, it just we are living the dream because you know I grew up around Microsoft people, mm-hmm. and this was kind of right before Netflix caught on with the DVDs, okay. where Blockbuster was developing this box that you could take home. This is at least what they said. If this mm-hmm. isn't true, I'm sorry. But <laughs> Ew, like well. they were saying, like the dream at least was Blockbuster would have like a box that you could rent, and it would have like their whole library on it. And it'd be like some sort of subscription or a fee. And essentially, if you think about it, that's like a primitive version of what we have now. What we have now, And we're so spoiled where pretty much any movie that you can think of, even if it's like some obscure Soviet 1960s thing, you can find it somewhere. And what's the most you pay to watch a movie? Like $4, $3, 3 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, depending on the movie. But I mean, there is some movies that is like $20. Yeah. And you're like, I'm not going to pay $20 for you. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Because I will pay $20 if I'm going to have it physically. I feel like for me, then it will be worth it. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, if I have it physically, where do I wash it? I don't have a place to wash it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I feel that. It's so funny. You know, thinking about that, I feel like the only movie that we have bought recently is... What was it? In the Heights. Yeah. I haven't seen that. Actually. You haven't seen that? I really like it. I don't know. I think it's probably with the Latin part of it. So I think that I really enjoyed it. But yeah, I don't think we have bought any other movie. Uh, like, I have to admit, Izzy and I did buy the complete Harry Potter collection. Oh, really? I think it was like Black Friday or day after <laughs> Christmas or something. And it was like all... Five ninety nine for all? Yeah, it was some crazy deal. And it actually is amazing when... Because it's on my YouTube library oh. so no matter where we are in the world you basically can we can watch those and we watch them every fall really yeah that's been my whole thing at school actually is oh. we pretend in the fancy film world like harry potter and lord of the rings never happened and it drives me crazy and i was like harry potters are good movies and i will die on that hill yeah yeah i mean there is also i feel like sometimes probably with movie people more or like ballet people too it's like there is things that are probably so bad but if you take joy out of it, that means they are good. Oh, yeah. They purpose their job, you know? They have a good life. I don't know. That's how oh, I feel. Oh, I feel that way 100%. Um, yeah. That's why you got to get Letterboxd, because on Letterboxd, you can have your top <laughs> movies, and, and people get very offended that, like, I put Wayne's World as one of the best movies of all time. Uh-huh. Because then when they when they are like, oh, well, it's not, and I'm like, well, are you talking about cinematography uh-huh. or story because that movie makes me a happy person so if that's the goal of m- filmmaking then it has achieved mount everest because exactly. like i just hear that the the words wayne's world and i'm like in a better mood yep totally no and that's how i feel i feel like i like sometimes like movies that are so bad yeah like so bad like the story is bad everything cinematography wise is bad but i love it yeah and i'm like how am i liking this but I did a guest team once and we put on, I might be messing this up. There's like this whole collection of like B-rated cable channels that Uh I didn't grow up with. So I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Lifetime. Okay. And I was with Preston actually. Oh, really? And we were in Southern Illinois, I think Marion, Illinois, like a really small town. And we've watched one and then we kind of had dinner and kept it on. We just like 
the whole trip just kept watching these Lifetime movies, oh, okay. and they were all like basically the like, same. The same story. It was always like some like troubled, you know, lead that ended up killing everyone yep. and all this stuff. It, but it was uh, that was good. That was quality filmmaking, in my opinion, because yeah. it drew me in. <laughs> exactly. If 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 it gives you a feeling, I think they did their job. Yeah. I don't know. It, yeah, sometimes I feel like I feel the, that way about Christmas movies. I can watch the cheesiest Christmas movies ever, and I love them. Yeah. I'm like, how am I watching this? But I love it. And like a Lifetime, I think it has like a full Christmas theme because I was a guest in this past December. I watched so many Lifetime movies. And yeah. Like the Hallmark or something like that. Yeah, Lifetime and Hallmark are like the way to go during <laughs> so that time here. No, I, I get you. And that's another thing that I find really interesting is I know we're getting off topic a little bit, I but I really don't understand in the film world. There's a lot of people who like refuse to look at TV. Mm -hmm. And I think that TV is such an important part of filmmaking. And as I've told you many times before, like we've connected on the fact that I think that you learn to be a filmmaker by doing music videos and by doing music videos and doing just like online content. And I was reading about how the reason that movies became more fast paced and more interesting, ultimately leading to things like Star Wars was because they were competing with TV and mm -hmm. TV had a lot of cuts in it to compete with the other channels. Like, so if there was yep. more cuts in a commercial, there was less chance that someone would get change. bored and uh -huh. change the channel. And so, I don't know, I think that circle of influence is really it's cool to to be an active participant you have to yeah and not just be someone who makes a change after it's gone through this whole cycle and everyone else has been watching tv and everyone else has this expectation and then you're just like way behind the eight ball at that mm -hmm. point yeah i mean it's kind of like the same for dancing you have to be looking at every single part of it because if not you are missing what is going to be like the next you know how you can evolve as a dancer yeah. because for example as a dancer or as at any part job like if you're looking at tap dancer, you're looking at contemporary dancer, uh, I don't know, like a tango dancer or something else, like a ballroom. They all have something that you can take for your performance or like for your role or whatever you are representing. The same thing is with the TV, you know, like somebody on in YouTube could be doing something so interesting that a filmmaker could watch and be like, if I can replicate this. Yeah. I don't know. No, I used to always get interviewed at Dayton Ballet. We have these interview sessions after each show. And multiple times, people will be like, who inspired you to dance? Who Who's like your favorite male mm -hmm. dancer? Because I'd usually be the only guy being interviewed. And I would always be like Michael Jackson. And it was always like people laughed after. But to your point, there's this video that I saw at Costco of all places when I was a kid. <laughs> and I think it's the 1995 MTV Music Video I Awards. I love that one. Oh, have, you know what I'm talking I about? Have, I have seen it like a million times. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm surprised I haven't broken the internet. I've watched it so many times. Me too. But like, I still remember seeing like a row, a wall of televisions of him walking forward in silhouette, like just doing the isolation, uh -huh. spinning around and boom, spotlight on him. And, and Billie Jean. Yeah. It was just like one of those things where however my young mind thought to itself it was along the lines of like that is like the coolest man i have ever, ever seen. seen and i still kind of feel that way <laughs> yeah no totally i totally agree actually i love the video yeah. like i remember watching it in colombia like a million times i i used to know the choreography because i loved it so much how long it is like a 14 15 minute yeah dance i loved it do you know why i feel like it hits every beat that appeals to like a young boy because it's like he's cool and it's mm -hmm. like very indi individualistic but then it has that he one of the things that i love about michael jackson that i'm learning about myself actually mm -hmm. is how he really was obsessed with like golden era hollywood he loved oh. the like if you think about like uh he loved like the fedora and the old suits and the black have you ever seen oh. his the movie that came out after he passed away this is it this is a yeah yeah where he like superimposed himself into like the old um hollywood movies and black and white and stuff no. like that it's it's really it's cool I but going, remember. going back to that show it's cool that he has a one section with slash where it's like rock and mm -hmm. roll and he's like a heavy metal star but then two minutes later he's got like the cool hat on and there's yep. all like the fake gunshots and uh -huh. stuff it's fun for dangerous yeah mm -hmm. no i love it that's pretty pretty damn cool i really like how you're saying because as a dancer, you will hear like, oh, Barishnikov, 
or like you know when somebody asks you like who's your favorite dancer or like who inspires you i really like the answer of like still a dancer but it's not really in your but that's what inspired you to go into this yeah. place i really really like that i actually never heard somebody say that oh, i feel like because i feel like for example for me when somebody if somebody asks me that i feel like oh i have to stay in my corner like i yeah. cannot go into like this corner over there even though it's still the same floor is no it's not the same corner you know what i mean yeah i don't know Something I've learned about film that I want to bring into the ballet world is we use this word all the time in my film studies class, like intertextuality. And if you just Google that, it doesn't come up with the way that we use it. Kind of like mm -hmm. how we have our own like definitions of the ballet words that are not like the true French translation. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure that tendu is not used in a sentence the same way that we would use it. Probably. But intertextuality is essentially, think of a movie where it's like you and I are talking and on the TV, it's like the Michael Jackson video. Mm -hmm. And the movie's not about that at all, but you and I have this moment where we're just kind of hanging out and we're like, oh, I love that scene. Like they call it intertextuality where they're like, where you're referencing something else, whether it's a part of that world or not, but it all is still considered part of the film world. And so I'm trying to be more confident in the sense of like, yeah, it's okay for me to have like obscure references. Like mm -hmm. I used to think it was pretentious when someone's like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm inspired by like Picasso or whatever, but mm -hmm. I've become more open to that where it's like, yeah, like I used to think it was weird that I love Michael Jackson so much. And, but I'm kind of learning that there is a connection between all art, everything where I used to think of like, oh, I'm leaving ballet to go into film. And I'm realizing there is this huge crossover that most people just ignore because they're not looking for it because mm -hmm. if you're not a dancer there's no reason they're not doing anything wrong exactly but yeah so i'm finding kind of this this space that they're like the dancer has occupied the film world literally since like the 1800s you oh, know some of the sure. first you know um like some of the first like edison films that we we're watching they've got like you know dancers under a single spotlight you know oh. like all jittery and stuff it's like a 10 second film that people watch like through this like, little kinetoscope looking gas glass thing you know so huh. yeah. never 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 thought of that but i like i really like that and i feel like actually the biggest artists in the world they are inspired by regular people yeah they are inspired by something that shouldn't be like inspiring you know what I mean? And I feel like that's kind of something like dancers and every single artist should look for. Like be inspired by something that truly to be redundant inspires you, like bring that joy. Yeah. I don't know. No, I agree. It's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Going going back a little bit to like dancing and to like who inspires you. What would be like the dream movie? You know, like because you wanted it to be a little bit of dancing or no, or like all these things, right? Choreograph. Would it be like a romantic thing or would it be like, I don't know. I don't... Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So I'm really obsessed with the 1930s and 40s. 1930s. And then also the 1980s. So I have like two... <laughs> I have two separate dreams that are really big. But I... I love personal relationships but I also am intrigued by how they get affected by big change. And I think really where that comes from is, you know, my own experience with Izzy and I, it's like our relationship was so about us and then the pandemic happened. And then it's like totally out of our control. All these things are happening. So even my entrance film that I made for school mm -hmm. was about a couple who met during the Great Depression. Their life oh. was getting better. And then they got separated because when the draft happened yeah, oh. with the war. And so... My dream would be to do something like that in the 1930s, like a romance between two characters that are involved like on the acting front or the dancing front in that 1930s setting. But then what that was like as like World War II was breaking out and then all of a sudden, if you're a guy, you've got to go to who knows where and yeah. do who knows what. Like there's a lot of things that we kind of take for granted where we're like, oh, you know, old people, they're just so irritating. But what that generation went through, no oh. matter where you're from, it's it's literally insane. Yeah, it's so insane. I mean, I don't want to think about it, but because I feel like we're gonna go to something similar very soon. Yeah, monetarily wise. I mean, I don't know war wise if we're gonna be in that because I feel like right now a war will literally blow up the war. Yeah, but 
It's like that thought about it, though, yes, you know? Yes, that's pretty crazy. But I really like the idea of it. I think, would you put it like ballet dancers? Or would it be like just like, I don't know, cabaret or something like that? I mean, um, it's just... I would like to have it be, have you seen Singing in the Rain? So like ballet definitely inspired, but maybe more on like the jazz just side. Like... But because it's me and I have like a higher standard for ballet, of course, <laughs> I would want it to be like ballet trained ballet dancers. Trained dancers. Huh, that's pretty interesting. Have you thought like doing like short films or something like that while you are in school? Oh, yeah. I've got a couple of short films um, in the making. Uh, one right now that I'm very serious about is there's... Have you heard of the Siege of Lenin Leningrad? This is also during World War II. No. So um, Nazi soldiers came into Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg, I believe, okay. in Russia. And they held the city captive for a really long time. And tons of people died. And there's mm -hmm. this... There is a story based on real life about this girl who was like writing down notes over the whole thing and the whole family passes away eventually. But she like she wrote down like as each person was was going Oof. and it's really it's really heavy, but it's been right it's been something that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. Okay. But I'll tell you the dream, though. I'll, I'll, I'll admit this to you. I would really love to be the person who does, like, the Balanchine movie one day. Oh, the Balanchine movie. That is actually my my dream because I think that that would be enlightening and entertaining. But also, it would be it would be so controversial in the ballet world that everyone would have to go see it. <laughs> yeah. I, I have such a misfeelings about him. Like... That's why it would be great. <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. I mean, more coming from like knowing Gelsey and all of that, you know. But that would be, I can see that. That yeah. would be fun to watch. I'll keep waiting. Yeah. Who knows how many years? I mean, you never know. Yeah. If you pitch it to the right people, then you yeah. can make it happen. That would be pretty, pretty fun. All right. To, to end, the, do you, what would you tell? somebody that is going through like the transition of retiring or like the transition of going into the unknown or calling it different way like how would you tell them to keep going and like they you are not stop being a dancer you will always be a dancer and it's okay to move on into the next thing um don't let ballet bring you down it's actually going to support you more than you realize like i've known a lot of people who have retired and they've like deleted all their friends from their contact list that had to do with ballet and then they they become something in the business world and they they pretend like that whole part of their life never, never existed existed. but pull from it as much as you can because we're really lucky to live in a time now where people respect ballet at least where i'm at and i think that there's a lot to be learned from it so so look at ballet from a non-dancer point of view and realize that it has given you a lot like you could dance for the smallest company on earth but if you've gone through the process of learning choreography and performing a show you've done so many valuable things that we just take for granted out in the world so yeah just let let ballet be a positive part of your life i really like that thank you so much for of, being here of course thank you for having me no thank you adam that was great i really love what you say oh thank you like perfect way to end it please guys don't forget to review give us a five star review i mean you don't have to give us a five star review but review and will be lovely so thank you so much yeah <laughs> five star reviews only though highly encouraged <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening to beyond the mirror if you enjoyed this podcast please hit follow or subscribe so you can stay up to date on new episodes until next time